find the uh, the real belief in flying saucers is most easily obtained if you look at the contact myths. There are several hundred people in, in the United States who claim to have had personal contact with the inhabitants of flying saucers who have landed. And if you examine these myths, you find that uh, there are some peculiar regularities. The uh, inhabitants of saucers are benevolent. I mean, they're really concerned for our well-being. They're omnipotent, extremely powerful, omniscient, extremely knowledgeable, and uh, they often wear long white robes. Now, this combination is something I've heard in another context. This isn't science. This is religion. Uh, and what I, what I suspect is happening is this. We live in, a, in very unsettled times. Uh, it used to be possible to believe in a personal, benevolent, powerful, all-knowing God who cared individuals who you could pray to, but now, there's very few people who really believe that, I, I think. Uh, science, for good or for ill, has destroyed a lot of the traditional theologies. Uh, and yet people have the same needs to believe that they always did, perhaps more so because of the times we live in. Well, the flying saucer myths are a really clever compromise. It's a way of having beings that come from the sky, that are worried about us, that are powerful, um, that are going to step in and prevent us from destroying ourselves, as we may very well might, uh, and yet have it in the cloak of science, so that no one can say nonsense that doesn't match science. It's all very pseudo-scientific. I would think that, uh, that at least for the contact myths and probably for a lot of the uh, events of people who just see things that understand flying overhead, uh, that what's involved uh, psychology and theology and not so much the physical sciences. If the general picture, however, of a Big Bang followed by an expanding universe is correct, what happened before that? Was the universe devoid of all matter and then the matter suddenly, somehow, created? How did that happen? In many cultures, the customary answer is that a god or gods created the universe out of nothing. But if we wish to pursue this question courageously, we must, of course, ask the next question. Where did God come from? If we decide that this is an unanswerable question, why not save a step and conclude that the origin of the universe is an unanswerable question? Or, if we say that God always existed, why not save a step and conclude that the universe always existed, that there's no need for a creation, it was always here. These are not easy questions. Cosmology brings us face to face with the deepest mysteries, with questions that were once treated only in religion and myth. Connected to B, B is connected to C, and sometimes A really is connected to B. And that's called association learning. We find patterns. We make those connections. Whether it's Pavlov's dog here uh, associating the sound of the bell with the food and then he salivates to the sound of the bell, or whether it's a Skinnerian rat in which he's having an association between his behavior and a reward for it, and therefore he repeats the behavior. In fact, what Skinner discovered uh, is that if you put a pigeon in a box like this and he has to press one of these two keys and he tries to figure out what the pattern is and you give him a little reward in the hopper box there, if you just randomly assign rewards such that there is no pattern, they will figure out any kind of pattern and whatever they were doing just before they got the reward, they repeat that particular pattern. Sometimes it was even spinning around twice counterclockwise, once clockwise, and peck the key twice. Uh, and that's called superstition, and that, I'm afraid, we will always have with us. I call this process patternicity, that is, the tendency to find meaningful patterns in both meaningful and meaningless noise. When we do this process, we make two types of errors. A type one error, or false positive, uh, is believing a pattern is real when it's not. Our second type of error is a false negative, a type two error, is not believing a pattern is real when it is. So let's uh, do a thought experiment. You are a hominid three million years ago walking on the plains of Africa. Your name is Lucy, okay. And, uh, and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator or is it just the wind? Your next decision could be the most important one of your life.
Well, if you think that the rustle in the grass is, is a dangerous predator and it turns out it's just the wind, you've made an error in cognition. You made a type one error, a false positive. But no harm, you just move away, you're more cautious, you're more vigilant. On the other hand, if you believe that the rustle in the grass is just the wind and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, you're lunch. You've just won a Darwin Award. You've been taken out of the gene pool. Now the problem here is that patternicities will occur whenever the cost of making a type 1 error is less than the cost of making a type 2 error. This is the only equation in the talk, by the way. We have a pattern detection problem that is assessing the difference between a type 1 and a type 2 error is highly problematic, especially in split-second life and death situations. So the default position is just believe all patterns are real. All rustles in the grass are dangerous predators and not just the wind. And so I think that we evolved. There was a natural selection for the propensity for our belief engines, our pattern-seeking brain processes to always find meaningful patterns and infuse them with these sort of predatory or intentional agencies that I'll come back to. So, for example, what do you see here? It's a horse head, that's right. It looks like a horse, must be a horse. That's a pattern. And is it really a horse or is it more like a frog? See, our pattern detection device, which is, appears to be located in the uh, anterior cingulate cortex, it's our little sort of detection device there, can be easily fooled, and this is the problem. For example, what do you see here? Yes, of course, it's a cow. Once I prime the brain, it's called cognitive priming. Once I prime the brain to see it, it pops back out again, even without the pattern that I've imposed on it. And what do you see here? Some people see a Dalmatian dog. Yes, there it is. And there's the prime. So when I go back, without the prime, your brain already has the model. When we're growing up, we tend to be pretty credulous. We just believe almost anything that people tell us, especially authorities and adults and textbooks and politicians and television, YouTube, the internet. I mean, there's just this sort of sea of information coming at us. And how can you tell the difference between, you know, it's right or it's wrong? You know, how do you know? People believe weird things because our brains are wired up to find meaningful patterns. You think you see the face in the cloud or the face on Mars or the Virgin Mary in a grilled cheese sandwich or on the side of a window. Many patterns are real and it's good to know what those patterns are and that's called learning. We connect A to B and often A really is connected to B. The problem is a lot of patterns are false. They're superstitious thinking. They aren't real. Well, I'm often asked when I give talks, you know, why should we believe you skeptics? And my answer is, you shouldn't. <laughs> you shouldn't believe anybody based on authority or whatever position they might have. You should check it out yourself. And we call this generally our baloney detection kit, sort of inspired by Carl Sagan's idea that there's a lot of baloney out there and we need a kit to detect it. And that kit is called science, and that's what science does best. So the first of our baloney detection questions you should always ask when you hear somebody make a claim is, you know, how reliable uh, is the source of the claim? You do expect some errors to creep into data, of course. So our fourth point in our baloney detection kit is to ask, does this really fit with the way the world works? When you get one of those emails about the Nigerian, you know, inheritance of $20 million, if you'll just send your money to them and then they'll send you the big pile of money, Really, come on, is that really the way the world works? I mean, a pile of money for nothing? Probably not. For example, in archaeology, we often hear about, you know, the pyramids, the mystery of the pyramids. Who built the pyramids? The Egyptians built them. Oh, no, they couldn't have built them, you know, because, wow, they're incredibly complex and so on. Well, you know, it's just a pile of rocks, right? I mean, they had a lot of free time, a lot of cheap labor, never rains centuries to build these big pile of rocks, you know, come on, it's not that complicated. But even if it were true that somebody else built the pyramid, say maybe 20,000 years ago, this is one theory. Maybe the lost continent of Atlantis and the Atlanteans came over there and built the pyramids. If that were true, when you do the archaeological dig, you should find the tools, the trash, the junk of the people who lived there, the houses where they lived, and that is what you find, dated at the time of the Egyptians. So if it was the aliens or the Atlanteans or whatever, you would find other artifacts to support that. So our fifth question you always want to ask, has anyone tried to falsify this or disprove the claim? In other words, it's one thing to pile up a
What should be done about the fact that our kids lag woefully far behind children in other countries in the areas of physics and mathematics? You know, my first reply is, as a parent, mm -hmm. get out of their way. When you're a kid, you're born a scientist. What does a scientist do? We look up and say, I wonder what that is. Let me go find out. Right. Let me poke it. Let me <laughs> break it. Let me, let me turn it around. This is what kids do. Mm -hmm. you, you can't let a kid alone for a minute without them laying waste to your house, okay, because they're grabbing stuff off the shelves. And so what do we do? We prevent that. Mm -hmm. We prevent these depths of curiosity from revealing themselves, even within our own residences. And so I swore that when I had kids, and I do have kids, I got an 11-year-old and a 7, but when they were young and still today, mm -hmm. if they see something they want to experiment with, even if they might break it, I just let it go. Let the experiment run its course. Because therein are the souls of, is the soul of curiosity that leads to the kind of mind you would want as a scientist. So you talk about events that can cause the end of the world. Does this uh, knowledge keep you awake at night? Yes. Yes. It might keep me awake in a different way than others. There are many people who, when faced with disaster, impending disaster, they say to themselves, okay, let me buy emergency food, let me find the shelter to go to, let me alert, the, let me... Okay, when you're trained as a scientist or an engineer, that's not the first thing you think of. First thing you think of is, how can I prevent the disaster? Right. Here comes the asteroid. You're going to like run away from it? Or are you going to say, how can I figure out how to deflect it? Mm -hmm. That's why you want scientists and engineers in your midst. Otherwise, you're just running away from every possible disaster <laughs> that could affect life on Earth. And what kind of life is that? What is the most astounding fact you can share with us about the universe? Uh, I want to do just a fast tirade on stupid design. And uh, this will be fast. Uh, look at all the things that just want to kill us, okay? Uh, most planet orbits are unstable. Uh, star formation is completely inefficient. Most places in the universe will kill life instantly. Instantly. The people who say, oh, the forces of nature are just right for life. Excuse me. <laughs> just look at the volume of the universe where you can't live. You will die instantly. That is not, that's, not, that's not what I call the Garden of Eden. All right? Uh, uh, galaxy orbits, that we orbit once every couple hundred million years, you're bound to come close to a supernova that will wipe out your ozone layer and kill everybody on the surface who doesn't otherwise have dark skin because your high energy rays will give you skin cancer. Um, we're on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy. Gone is this beautiful spiral that we have. And of course, we're on a one-way expanding universe as we wind down to oblivion as the temperature of the universe asymptotically pro approaches absolute zero. That's the universe. Then Earth, volcanoes, a tsunami just killed, uh, you know, I think that number is higher, up 200,000 people, floods, tornadoes. None of this is any sign that there's a benevolent anything out there. And this 90%, it should be 99%, as was earlier noted, that's a, um, of all life that has ever lived is now extinct. Inner solar system is a shooting gallery, comets, uh, uh, asteroids, duck. Um, and look how long it took to make multicellular life. Not from the beginning of the Earth. Life happened quickly, but not multicellular life. Uh, you needed your cyanobacteria to sort of crank on the oxygen, get the oxygen budget going. Then you could have sort of, uh, that's sort of rocket fuel for multicellular creatures. But that took three and a half billion years. That's hardly an efficient plan with us in mind. Um, and in human beings, this is like the most tragic of them. I don't even include here the expression of free will where people want to kill each other. I'm talking about nature killing us without the help of human beings. Aggressive childhood leukemia, hemophilia, all of this, all of this. And we so much praise about the human eye, but anyone who's seen the full breadth of the electromagnetic spectrum will recognize how blind we are, okay? And part of that blindness means we can't see, we, we can't detect magnetic fields, ionizing radiation, radon. We are like sitting ducks for, for ionizing radiation. Um, we have to eat constantly because we're warm-blooded? Crocodile eat a chicken a month, it's fine, okay? So we're always looking for food. These gases at the bottom, you can't smell them, taste them, you breathe them in, you're dead, okay? <laughs> so, I'm almost done, I'm sorry, I'm taking up your time here. So, so, and with the birth defects, most 